Hello, everyone. Nice to see you all. Good morning. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> so welcome to session six of our course. Um, today, uh, as promised, we're not talking about any of the foremost theories. We are talking about Bikuni Vinaya in Sikamana training. And um, so before we start, as usual, I will chant the Namotasa. And if you want, you can chant along. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang Dhammang Sankang Namasami. So, um, for today I have prepared a PowerPoint presentation, not our usual uh, reading material. So, I will share my screen and then we can start. So, hopefully you should be able to see this now. Today is our session six about Bhikkhuni Vinaya and Sikamana training. And um, um, when we talk about Bhikkhuni Vinaya, of course, we're not only talking about the Pali school of Vinaya. We are uh, talking about all the material that we have preserved in all the schools. So for the Bhikkhunis, we have material from seven schools. And altogether we have eight texts because one school, the Mula Savastivada, um, has the text preserved in both Chinese and in Tibetan. And originally I was planning to explain this whole diagram to you and how all the schools relate to each other. But then I realized that my presentation is way too long and this is actually um, way too complicated also. So I just want to um, show you this um, orange box here below. These are the seven schools which uh, have texts that survive until today. And uh, these are the schools that we are working with today. So uh, here, first we have three uh, schools that are like twin schools or si twin siblings, or probably I should say triplets. So the, the first one here is the Dhammaguptaka school. Uh, they have a text preserved in Chinese and this is the school uh, in which the Mahayana monastics still practice until nowadays. And then there is the Mahishafaka school, which is also a school that has a Chinese text, but this school is extinct. So nobody is practicing with that anymore uh, nowadays. And then of course we have the Mahavihara, also called the Theravada, nowadays we call it Theravada, with our Pali text. And then we have two schools um, that are more distantly related to these three schools here which are the Savastivada with a Chinese text and the Mula Savastivada with a Chinese and a Tibetan text. And the Mula Savastivada is the school that also still survives and in which the Tibetan monastics practice, or especially the Tibetan monks, because bhikkhuni ordination was never introduced in Tibet. So uh, throughout the history of Buddhism, they never had uh, Mula Savastivada bhikkhunis there. And that's uh, now there are efforts underway to um, introduce a Bikuni ordination there, but it's very difficult. Um, and hopefully at some point they will be able to do that. And then um, very distantly related to the other schools are these two, which are the Mahasangika with a Chinese version and the Lukutaravada with a Sanskrit version. Uh, so these are the schools that are the most distantly related to the others because they split um, in the first split. Um, and these are really fascinating texts, especially the Sanskrit one here, because as we can see, this is the only one except for the Pali, which is preserved in the Indian original. Um, so when we translate texts into other languages, then we lose a bit of meaning, we lose a bit of information there, but uh, it is very fascinating to um, compare the Pali version with this uh, Sanskrit version especially because they are from so distant, distantly related schools. So um, we can learn a lot 
uh, from that. And I will show you an example later on. And basically, uh, whatever the, these two schools agree on has a fairly good chance of being from the early period of Buddhism, from the unified period of Buddhism before the school, before Buddhism broke into different schools. So, um, yeah, we'll see a little bit um, more about all this later, so you'll understand why this is important. And now I have prepared one small slide uh, for people who have not worked with Vinaya much before. So basically Vinaya, um, just very broadly, um, comes in, uh, like the Vinaya is broadly divided into two um, parts. One is the Patimokkha, which are the monastic codes for the monks and for the nuns. So they contain the, the, the main rules. And for the Patimokkha, we also have explanatory material called the Vibhanga or sometimes called the Sutta Vibhanga. And the other part is the so-called Kandakas and they contain monastic procedures such as, for example, the ordination procedure and later rules and also many stories and so on. So of these two parts, the part that is uh, most like that could potentially be early are the Patimokkha rules themselves. So uh, if you want to study Vinaya that goes back to an early period of Buddhism, then the Patimokkha is the, the part that we should look at first. And in order to understand the situation for bhikkhunis here, um, it's very important to understand the situation for bhikkhus first um, and then compare um, how um, the situation, like how the bhikkhuni Patimokkha uh, has fared uh, in, compared to the bhikkhu one. So, uh, First of all, before we work with the Bhikkhuni Patimokkha now, I want to show you one slide about the Bhikkhu Patimokkha. And if that looks complicated, then don't worry. Uh, it's actually not, not that complicated and I will explain it in a bit of detail. So um, here in the first row, what we have here, uh, the different schools of Buddhism, so the Pali school and then various Chinese version. And here in the first row, what we have are the different classes of Patimokkha rules, from the most serious one, which are called Parajika, to um, the most minor ones, which are called the Sekhyas. So Sekhyas are basically like table manners and questions of etiquette, uh, whereas Parajikas are very serious. If you break a Parajika rule, you have to disrobe immediately and you cannot ordain again in this life. So you should really try not to break one of these. And uh, now we can see in the class of Parajika, uh, all the schools have four rules. So the numbers agree in all the Patimokkas, and not only the numbers agree, but also the content is the same. So it's the same four rules in all of the Patimokkas. So we can see it's uh, quite well preserved. Um, so that, that's very good, which points us to the fact that this probably stems from the early period of Buddhism, uh, and very likely even goes back to, um, to the Buddha himself who laid down those rules. And then uh, for the next most serious class of offenses, the Sangha diseases, we have 13 in all the schools. For the Aniyatas, we have two. For the Nisagyas, we have 30 in all the schools. So we see there's a really, really good correspondence and not only the numbers agree, but also the content of those rules agree with each other. For the Pachityas, the situation is almost perfect, but not quite. So uh, there are between 90 to 92 rules in all the schools. Um, and so there, there is a minor variance, both in the number and in, in the content. But overall, for a text that is several millennia old and that was preserved across a vast geographical area, uh, pretty much independent from each other, um, this is really, really an amazing, um, amazing correspondence here. For the Pati Desaniyat, again, we see that there are four in all classes, in all, in all schools. And for the Adhikaranas, we see that there are seven. So if you are a bhikkhu and you want to practice with this, this Pati Moka, I think you can be quite reassured that this is actually how the Buddha wanted you to practice, that your rules do go back to the Buddha. And this would, of course, give you a lot of inspiration and a lot of faith in the Buddhist tradition. And the only um, class of offenses that varies between schools are the so-called Sikhyas, which as I mentioned are very minor rules and they vary from 66 uh, in the Mahasangika tradition uh, to 75 in Pali and then up to 
as we, I cannot give a proper number around 108 here. And the reason why I cannot give a proper number is that even within those schools, we have several texts and those texts do not agree with each other. So there are plus minus 10 rules, more or less, in um, those traditions. Um, so we see the Sikhias are not very well preserved. It's very likely that the Sikhias were added to at a later time and that they um, would have changed over time. And um, so for the Sikhias, we can say that they have undergone changes over time. But uh, for the rest of the Bhikkhu Patimokha, the situation is really pretty ideal. Um, so with that in mind, we can now look at the Bhikkhuni Patimokha. And um, this is the exact same table with the exact same schools and the exact same classes of offenses. The only thing I have adapted is the numbers for the Bhikkhunis. And uh, again, we look at the Parajikas and we see um, all the schools have eight Parajikas, which is good news because of course, if this is a rule, that when, like if you break it and then you have to disrobe, so um, clearly you have to be fairly certain what those rules are and what the contents are and in which cases you would break them and in which cases it's not an offense. So it, it's really important that these rules are properly preserved and we can see they are fairly well preserved. And also the content um, mostly agrees with each other with minor variances. Um, so overall, we can be fairly uh, confident about the Parajikas and that's very important. Um, for the other classes of offenses, the picture is a little bit different. So for the Sangha diseases, which are still quite serious rules, we can see that there are 17 in um, many of the schools, especially schools that are closely related to each other, such as the first three. Um, and then there are variances here, uh, 20 and 19. So, and, and the problem also is that even here, those schools that have 17 rules, uh, these are not necessarily exactly the same 17. So there are um, small variances here, even in the contents um, of those rules. And, um, in two weeks, when we talk about the ascetic nuns, uh, I'm planning to have a look at one of the Sangha di Cesas and compare them across the different schools. So then you can get um, a taste of like how schools, uh, how, how one rule or multiple rules could vary between schools. Um, so I will show you an example, just not today. Um, and then Bikunis do not have Aniyatas but they have Nisagya Pachityas and we see that there are 30 rules in, in all schools, except for this school, the Mula Savasivada, which always has, seems to have more rules than the others. Um, but if you only look at the numbers, that would be highly misleading because the numbers agree, but the contents do not agree. So um, as I mentioned uh, a few times before already in previous sessions, um, Bikuni, Bikunis and Bikus share many rules, but then also um, each group has rules of their own. So in the class of Nisagya Pachityas, Bikunis share about 18 rules with the Bikus, plus minus one or two, depending on the school. Uh, and so they have about 12 rules of their own. So the rules that are shared with the Bikus uh, agree fairly well across the schools. The rules that they have on their own um, well, about half of them, let's say about six plus minus, um, have parallels between the schools. So the schools agree on them and about six are a total mess and they, they have no correspondence. Even in, um, even in schools that are fairly closely related, there is a really big mess. So, um, it seems that the Nisagiyas, um, yeah. That the, that the situation there is, is uh, quite confusing and that they were changed at a pretty late date still. Because um, as I mentioned, even closely related schools don't necessarily agree with each other. And um, um, like one reason for that could, for example, be that either the people remembered that there should be 30 rules, but they didn't remember which ones. So every school just proliferated on their own until they reached 30 again, or they saw that the Bikus have 30 in this category, and uh, it was difficult to accept that Bikunis had less, 
So every school came up with additional rules to fill up the 30. So like otherwise it's really difficult to explain how there could be um, the same number, but so much variance in the rules. And then we come to the Bachitias and here obviously the situation is really, really bad. Um, we see in the Malsangika tradition, we have 141 rules. In the Mahishasakas, we have 210, so 69 rules, almost 70 rules difference, which obviously is not a good situation. Very, very clearly, there were substantial reworking and substantial additions here in this class. And in this class, we have about 70 rules that we share with the bhikkhus, uh, plus minus two. Um, and those are pretty well uh, preserved and accord fairly well across the schools. Uh, but all the rules that are individual uh, and only kept by the Pekunis, um are not in a uh, very good condition. And then we have the Pati de Sanias. The Pati de Sanias do agree with each other quite well, except that the Munasara Sivara has added a few, two more extra, and uh, one that is copied from the Pekunis. Um, and then for the Sikhias, the situation is exactly the same as for the monks. So um, they also vary, but that's to be expected because the monks was also vary. Um, so when we look at the Bikuni Patimoka, it is much, much less well preserved than the Biku version. And that's of course problematic. And especially because we see that the Biku version is well preserved. That means the schools would have potentially been able to preserve text that well. It's just that, um, as we mentioned, mostly the monks were the guardians of the text and they did not practice those rules. They did not understand them that well and also probably didn't have that much interest in those rules. So um, that's why now we have that situation as it is. And of course, that's uh, for now for Bikunis, practicing Vinaya is much more complicated. Uh, it's much more conflicted because like we want to do what the Buddha taught and we want to follow his rules. But on the other hand, we don't really even know which of those rules are early. Or for the most part, we know that uh, quite a bit of them are late. So um, like we cannot have the same inspiration and the same kind of joy that bhikkhus can find when they practice their patimoka. Um, and then sometimes people say, well, you shouldn't worry too much about this because you know training rules are there to support your practice. So if you have more rules, then your practice is more supported. So the more rules, the better, basically. But when you actually look at some of these additional rules, they're like total nonsense rules. Like there are some rules about hairstyles when obviously we have a shaven head and there are rules about uh, body parts that we as women don't even have those body parts. So clearly like random rules were insert inserted into our Patimoka and nobody thought even like for one minute about what was going on. Otherwise these crazy rules would never have ended up in our Patimoka. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a little bit like as Pekunis, we have a much more complicated relationship with our Patimoka than the monks can have. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to show you this as a general introduction to uh, Bikuni Vinaya, just to show you um, to what extent um, the Bikuni Vinaya, Vinaya has undergone changes at a later time. So we really cannot assume that any part of the Bikuni Vinaya is actually early, not even the Patimoka. Um, so that is something that we should keep in mind. Um, and especially when we see that Bikuni Vinaya conflicts with other early sources, such as the Terigata, then um, it should be quite easy to determine which one is the earlier version and which one is the later, and not um, just rely on the Vinaya itself uh, on its own. And now uh, I want to talk with you about Sikamana training. As you mentioned, that there is a special interest. Some people have asked questions about it. But in order to talk about Sikamana training, we also have to talk about Bikuni ordination because the two um, topics are very closely um, related to each other. And um, of course, Sikamana training is a, a preparatory step for Bikuni ordination. So, um, important to look at both of them together. And um, the first point here is just to recap, we've mentioned this quite a few times before, there is no mention of dual ordination in any of the early texts. Um, and also in quite a few of the later texts, even commentarial texts, uh, we get the impression that bhikkhunis did their ordinations by themselves without the involvement of bhikkhus. 
Um, so that's another area where we see that uh, Bikuni Vinya has undergone quite a few changes over time. And especially if you compare different schools with each other, we see that their ordination procedures don't necessarily match up. So there are some schools such as the Kali school that just have a short confirmation ceremony done by the bhikkhus. And there are other schools that reduplicate the entire ordination ceremony uh, once by the nuns and then once again, uh, the complete thing by the monks uh, to varying de degrees of uh, complete, like that reduplication is in various uh, degrees of completeness. So we really see a development over time when we compare the vinyas, the different vinyas of the different schools. And uh, interestingly, um, in the Patimokas, there is only one rule for the monks. Um, but in the nuns Patimoka, we have more than 20 rules for nuns, inclu uh, including one rule that is a Sangha de Sesa, so a fairly serious kind of offense. And I put 20 plus instead of an exact number because again, it varies between schools. In the Pali, we have 24. In other schools, we have a few more or a few less. And uh, one reason why we have so many more is that there's a general tendency in the Bikuni Vinaya to proliferate rules as we have seen. But another thing is also that uh, for Bikus, there's one pathway to full ordination. Basically, in the early times, it was like, if you are below 20, you're ordained as a Samanera, a male novice. And if you're above 20 years old, then you will be ordained as a full bhikkhu. But for bhikkhunis, the situation is much more complex. We have different pathways, uh, depending on whether the candidate is, was married before or um, is, um, is a maiden. So, um, and then also we have uh, different preliminary forms of ordination, so sikamana, sikamanas that monks don't have. So because our situation is so much more complex and there are so many more uh, combinations that are possible, for that reason, we have so many more rules. Um, and one thing I also wanted to mention is that sikamanas are very well attested in early sources. For example, they're mentioned in the Bhikkhu Patimoka, which as we have seen is early and also quite a few times in the Tirigata. So even though I have mentioned there are so many later additions to the Bikuni Patimoka or the, the Bikuni Vinya in general, Sikamanas don't seem to be one of those additions. Sikamanas seem to be something that is actually early. Um, and um, when we talk about Bikuni ordination, it is also important to talk uh, about the terminology we use as Bikuni. So compared to the monks, we have very significantly different terminology. And that again points us towards the relative independence of the bhikkhunis in the early time. They did not copy the, the bhikkhus terminology. Uh, and that also uh, points us towards uh, the idea that bhikkhunis did their ordinations independently without the monks being present. Um, so, I think many people will be familiar with the word, upa, the word upasampada, which often is said to mean full ordination. And it does mean full ordination, but actually it means full ordination for monks. Uh, for the nuns, we use the word uttapana, which is basically a synonym of upasampada, but it's just uh, the word used for the nuns, sangha. And then um, some people will be familiar with the word upajaya. This means it's often translated as preceptor. It's basically a mentor that is the person who presides over the ordination ceremony and also the person who takes responsibility for the newly ordained monk or nun and trains them for a few years and makes sure that uh, yeah, they, they settle into monastic life well and they learn everything that they need to learn. So for the monks, this is called Upajaya. For the nuns, this is called Pavatini. And then the newly ordained um, nun is called Sahajivini. And uh, that is equivalent to the male form, uh, Sadiviharico, which in a female form would be Sadiviharini, but that word doesn't, isn't actually used that much because, um, well, the proper form to use for females is actually Sahajivini. And then, of course, we have the word Sikamana that the monks don't have because this is an ordination form that the monks don't have. Um, and here, this is an instance where we see. Um, where the Sanskrit Lokuta Ravada text is, uh, comes in um, or is helpful 
because um, not only in the Pali version, but also in the Sanskrit version, uh, we see that the Bhikkhunis had their own terminology um, and did not use the monk's terminology. So this is not a feature of the Pali tradition. This actually seems to be a feature of the early Sangha in general. Uh, and again, this points to the independence of the non Sangha. And also it has been shown that uh, these words are uh, the same or very similar uh, than words that the Jains use in their text. So we know that the Jain Sangha was contemporary to Buddhism. Uh, the Jain Sangha was probably established a few um, years or a few decades before the Buddhist Sangha came into being. Um, so again, that um, points us towards the idea that probably the early nuns who shaped the Bhikkhuni Vinaya were ascetics, maybe Jain, or maybe just the terminology that we see here might have been um, terminology that was current among the early ascetics, uh, among the early wandering communities, not only Jains, not only Buddhists, but just generally uh, all the Indian movements, religious movements or ascetic movements. And then both the Jains and the Buddhists might have been influenced by that. Um, but uh, we, see, like, we see that it is likely that the early nuns were, were ascetics and that they brought the previous experience and the previous vocabulary um, into Buddhism when they joined the Sangha. Um, and if Mahapajapati and her nuns, her 500 nuns, would have been the first bhikkhunis, that, then those were householders, like lay women before. So they wouldn't have known all this terminology. So it's very likely that they would have copied um, the terminology of the Buddhist monks. Um, but we see that's not what happened. What happened is we copied the terminology of the chains um, or of like general ascetic terminology. So again, it's very unlikely um, that the early nun Sangha was much influenced by the monk Sangha at this point. So um, yeah, it does seem that they were quite independent and did carry out their ordinations quite independently. And uh, one, one thing I wanted to address is it's sometimes said that um, Bhikkhunis have this different terminology because their ordination form is different from the monks. So because they have dual ordination, and it is claimed that those, ter those terms like Vutapana and Pavatini just refer to the female part of the ordination. So when the ordination is half finished and the, the Bhikkhunis have carried out their part, that should be called Vutapana. But once the monks have performed the full ordination, then it should be called Upasampada. And the female mentor is a Pavatini, but the actual real mentor of the monk side should be called an Upajaya and so on. But actually that's not what our Vinaya says. So in our Vinaya, I mean, as we know, the, um, the Vinaya texts were collected and then uh, transmitted by the monks in the first council. And uh, because those words were unfamiliar to them, because they didn't use those words themselves, they actually added word commentaries. And in the word commentaries, they clearly say, Uttapana means Upasampada, Pavatini means Upachaya, and so on. So it's very clear that they're, they're intended to be synonyms. Um, and that the early Sangha understood this to be synonyms and not prelim pre preliminary forms and then later forms of the ordination ceremony. And uh, ah, yes, here I have prepared a slide for you about the difference between Sikamanas and Samaneris because there were questions. I remember there was a question, is a Samaneri or is a Sikamana the same as an Anagarika? So no, Sikamanas um, are actual members of the Sangha and uh, Anagarikas obviously are considered lay people and Sikamanas and Samaneris also are not the same. So um, Samaneris, so female novices and Samaneras, male novices, um, these are ordinations that were originally intended for children. So adults probably never ordained as Samaneras or Samaneris, unlike the situation that we have today, where, where both monks and nuns often ordain for a few years as Samaneras or Samaneris before they take full ordination. And the reason, like one, one of the um, ways how we can know that these are ordinations for children is the name itself. So uh, Samaneri is a diminutive form of the word Samani. Um, and the word Samanera comes from the word Samana. So it means a small Samana or a small Samani. 
And of course, Samana means aesthetic. I think most people are familiar with the word. And Samani means female aesthetics, so these are children aesthetics. Um, so from the word itself, we already know this was intended for um, children or for teenagers. And Samaniers um, keep the 10 rules and their ordination is carried out by one fully ordained monastic. So um, a bhikkhuni can ordain a male Samanera and a bhikkhu can ordain a female Samaneri. It's possible to do this cross-gender. Uh, it's not recommended, but um, if you do it, then the ordination is fully valid. Um, so there isn't really a problem with cross-gender ordination here. For Sikamana, the situation is different. She has a higher status than a Samaneri and a Samanera. So she has a higher status than a male novice also. Um, in most schools, she keeps six rules. In those schools where she doesn't keep six rules, she keeps multiples of six. So 12 or 18 rules, which uh, again points us to the fact that probably that was a proliferation and probably six rules might have been the early version, if there was an early version at all. Um, and um, we're going to have a look at these rules because uh, we've talked about this before. Of course, now this is very confusing because Samaneris keep 10 rules, Sikamanas keep six rules. So what's going on here? We are going to look at the rules and see if we can make sense of that. Um, and Sikamana ordination is carried out by a full Sangha or fully ordained bhikkhunis. So this cannot be carried out by monks and it, it also cannot be carried out by one individual monastic. And it's intended as a preparation period for full ordination. So um, in a small way, this mimics the way that uh, bhikkhuni ordination would have been done in the early times by bhikkhunis alone. And so a Sikamana is already accepted by a full Sangha. Um, so she has more connection with the Sangha. She has people to turn to if anything happens to a preceptor. She has other people who already have a relationship with her who she can turn to. So um, this is basically an additional layer to, um, to almost be a bikini already, but not quite yet. Um, and oops, there, this is a slide uh, where I have uh, collected a few open questions about Sikamanas. Of course, there are many, many more open questions about Sikamanas, and we're not going to mention, uh, we're not going to answer them all. Um, but just um, to talk about um, the, uh, the gray areas where we don't really know much about Sikamanas. So, the first thing I've already mentioned what are the rules? We are going to look at that in a minute. Uh, and see if we can find an explanation that does make sense of the situation. Then there's also the question, in the early times, did everybody take Sikamana ordination? And there are reasons to think why that wasn't the case. So in the um, developed vineyards as we have them today, which obviously changed over time, Sikamana tr training is mandatory for everybody who wants to take bhikkhuni ordination. Uh, independent of the question whether they were married before or not, and um, how old they are, and whether they are children or adults or whatever, the Kamana training has become mandatory for everybody. But uh, it's likely that in the early times that might not have been the case, and it's possible that might that that might have that only people uh, below the age of twenty would have taken full ordination. Uh, sorry, would have taken the Kamana training in preparation for their full ordination at twenty if they were unmarried. And if they were married, actually, um, it's possible for bhikkhunis to be fully ordained um, at 12 years of age. So way before the bhikkhus, bhikkhus can only get fully ordained at the age of 20. But if the girl was married before, um, she could take full ordination at 12 years old and Sikamana training at 10 years old. And the reason for that, of course, is that in that time in India, a girl that was married had to leave her family, go to the in-laws house, where she was often treated quite badly, where she was treated like a servant, where she had to take a lot of responsibilities uh, and where she had, like basically her childhood was over at that point when she got married. So um, there were already quite independent uh, young women uh, quite capable of looking after themselves and quite capable of um, making decisions. 
So uh, that's why they could they could um, gain a full ordination at a pretty early stage at 12 years old. Um, and then another question that uh, comes up, did all Sikamanas train for two years uh, or was the training period previously um, different or was there a fixed training period at all? Um, so nowadays the training period is two years, uh, but we're like, there's really no hint in the early sources that that uh, was the case for everybody back then. And then uh, the last uh, open question I wanted to mention is that there is a very persistent belief and also at, uh, attested in several of the vineyards that the reason why a Sikamana has a higher status than a Samaneri, but yet keeps less rules is that because that is that um, they have to keep the rules much more strictly. So for um, Samaneris and also for Pekunis, for most of the rules, if we break them, we just confess them and then we start uh, and then, then I mean, there's, there's no real consequence other than that we confess it. But for Sikamanas, they would have to keep the rules completely unbroken for two years. And if they break one, then they, the two year period starts again. So that's one way to make sense of the six versus 10 rules question. But uh, to me, that uh, doesn't make sense at all because even as Bikunis, as I mentioned, we don't have to keep the rules unbroken. If we break one, we just confess and move on. So to expect this of a Sikamana who might have been a child or might, might have been a teenager, or in any case would have been a very new member of the Sangha, it's just unreasonable to expect them to keep rules to a standard that nobody else keeps. So to me, that's not really a good explanation to make sense of the um, Sikamana situation. So um, now we're going to have a look at the six rules or the however many rules, 12, 18 rules. Um, yeah, and yeah, before we do that, actually, I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of open questions and I hope you can see that the situation for, for Bikunis is quite unsatisfactory in regard to our vinaya. And in my personal opinion, only very little um, research has been done in this area. And I'm hoping that there, there are um, areas in which we can still resolve open questions if we do more research. So it doesn't need to be that confusing and that messy uh, forever. So I think probably we can discover a few things and clarify a few things. And that's why um, I'm doing translations. I'm translating the five Chinese vineyards into English. And I'm hoping to do a lot of work with that in the future. But at the moment, unfortunately, um, yeah, not much work has been done in that area. So we are in the situation um, that I have presented today where we actually have more questions than we have answers. And um, it's good to keep that in mind also when we now look at the rules because that's also going to be a bit messy. And I have not prepared a slide for this because there's a very wonderful website uh, which has a good overview. So we're going to use that website instead. And um, I will share <clears throat> that website with you now. <clears throat> so <coughs> um, hopefully you are able to see this website now. This is a really great website that was designed by Bantu Sujato and his team back in the day when he was the abbot at Santim Forest Monastery in Australia. And they did a lot of research into the Sikamana question. And he had uh, nuns on his team who did speak Chinese. So they did compare all the existing vineyards, I think, except for the uh, Tibetan version. And if you're interested, we are not going to look at everything that is here in detail today, but if you're interested, there is so much information here, you can go through it yourself. Uh, questions about the two-year training, uh, many comparative issues, the uh, request for training, so the Sikamana ordination, the question of maiden or married, like who did ordain a Sikamana, and so on. So th there's a lot of information here. And uh, if you want to, you can look at that yourself later on. Um, but here now, we're just going to look at the um, 
the rule set. And here we see in the first row, we have the different schools of Buddhism, the seven schools. Um, and the first one here is the Pali version. So we are looking at that one first. And in the Pali, we have six, uh, six rules and the six rules are no killing, no stealing, no sex, no lying, no alcohol and no eating at the wrong time. So we can clearly see these six rules are the first six of the eight precepts or the first six of the 10 precepts. So exactly the same that uh, Samaneris keep, except that Samaneris keep more rules. Um, so in the Pali version of these rules, it clearly doesn't make sense. Um, very difficult to reconcile anything here. Um, so yeah. Of all these schools, there's only one school, in my personal opinion, only one school that makes sense. But that doesn't mean that that, that school is early. But we'll see that in a minute. Now we are looking at the Mahishasaka version and the Dhammaguptaka version because these schools are very closely related to the Pali. In the Mah Mahishasaka version, the precepts are no killing, no stealing, no sex, no lying, no drinking alcohol, and no eating at the wrong time. So exactly the same as the Pali. And in the Dhammaguptaka version, there is no sex no stealing something of a uh, certain value, no killing human beings, no lying about personal attainments, no drinking alcohol, and no eating at the wrong time. So we see it's fairly similar, except that those uh, four rules have been upgraded to a somewhat stricter standard, a more, na more narrow standard. Um, and these are, of course, for people who know Vinaya, these are, of course, the first four Parajika rules. But generally, very, very similar um, topics here. So we might, now we might think, oh, three schools agree with each other, so this must probably be early. Um, but uh, if you think that, then um, that's, um, that would be misleading to think like this, uh, because uh, this is one of the instances where it's very important to know how the schools relate to each other um, and which schools develop from which parent schools. And as I mentioned, these uh, three schools are very closely related they're almost like twin sisters or like triplets. Um, so uh, it, the reason why they agree is that, is that they have the same parent school and probably uh, these, rule sets, these rule sets were um, developed uh, before they broke apart from their parent school. But uh, their parent school doesn't agree with any, any of the other schools. So uh, we know that this is not from an early time. Um, so what would be helpful if is if those schools would agree with the Mahasangika school because the Mahasangika school broke off in the first split. Uh, so theoretically, everything that they share should be from an early period of time. So now we look at the Mahasangika and see how that goes. And the Mahasangika has 18 rules. Uh, so three times six, very likely a proliferation. Um, and the first rule that they have that is that a Sikamana should have a meal in position after the bikinis, but before the samaneris. So very different from the other schools. Um, but this again um, um, clarifies the hierarchy of the sikamana after bikinis, but before the samaneris. And the next one is something that is an offense for her might not be for a bikini. So she she might keep rules that bikinis don't need to keep. And something that is an offense for a bikini would also be for her. So this means that she must keep the entire bikuni patimoka. Uh, so that's a lot of rules. Um, she may stay in the same room for three days with a bikuni, and she may stay in the same room for three days with a samaneri. This refers to some patimoka rules. Um, she may offer food to a bikuni, except for the kapiyankarui ceremony. If you don't know what the kapiyankarui ceremony is, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it's not important here for this. Uh, what is question now? Um, and she may, she herself can have, she can, can also have food offered from a samaneri. So we see there's not much correspondence in these first six or seven rules with the six rules of the other schools. And then a bikuni should not teach the patimoka to her, except for the parajika rules and the sangha diseases. So just now we saw that she needs to keep the entire patimoka, but a bikuni is not allowed to teach her. So clearly the rules are internally inconsistent in this school. Uh, but a bikuni should teach her no, no sex, no stealing, and no killing of human beings. And she cannot attend the oppositor in the Pavarana ceremony, of course, 
nobody who's not fully ordained can attend those ceremonies. So that's, that's clear anyway. And then if she has committed any of the last four paragic offenses, she should renew the training precepts on that same day. Uh, so as you might remember, Bikunis have eight paradikas, and if she breaks the last four, one of the last four, here we find the idea that she needs to renew the training again. Uh, so we'll start her two-year period over. But we see not, not for just any random break of any random rule, only if she breaks a paradika rule. So of course, paradikas are the rules that force a Bikuni to uh, disrobe immediately. So these are really serious rules. So that's kind of um, justifiable to keep them quite strictly. Um, and for the others, if she committed any other offense uh, down from the 18th, from the 19th Sangha de Cesar, then it's a very minor offense called a Dukata. And here, the last five rules are five pretty random things, not eating at the wrong time, not eating food that was stored overnight, not accepting money, not drinking alcohol, and no adornment with fragrant flowers. Um, yeah. So we see the roots are internally inconsistent and a little bit hard to make sense of, and not much correspondence with the other schools. Now we're looking at the Mula Savastivada. Um, this uh, is a school that has 12 rules. Uh, we saw again a multiple of six and is actually uh, subdivided into six Dhammas and six Anudhammas. So very clearly we see how, how the original number of six is still preserved and was then reduplicated. And uh, this school also has very different uh, rules. The first one is no walking alone, no crossing a river alone, no touching a man's body, no staying with a man, no acting as a matchmaker, and no concealing of Bikuni Parajika offenses. So for people who are familiar with the Bikuni Vinaya, they might, rec might recognize most of these rules. Uh, so we find these in the Bikuni Patimoka, but in various classes of offenses, some of these are Parajika, some of these are Sangha Disesas, and some of these are Pachityas. So pretty random assortment of rules here. And then for the other six rules is no handling money, no shaving the hair of the private parts, no digging, no destroying plants, no taking food that is not given. So these are five Pachitya rules. And the last one is no eating food that has been touched. So this isn't even a rule in uh, Patimoka. This is a later development of the rule about offering food. Um, so that is found in several schools, this idea that you can't eat food that has been touched. Um, but because that is a later development and not actually found in any of the Patimokas, we kind of know that this rule set also must be late, otherwise that rule couldn't be here. Um, and again, there's very few overlap with uh, the other schools. And now finally, uh, we come to the Savastivada school, which in my opinion is the only um, school that managed to come up with a set of rules that makes at least a bit of sense. Uh, but I don't think that means that, it, it, that this is early. I just think that this means that some people gave it some thought before they came up with the rules. Um, so in the Savastivada tradition, we again have six precepts. And actually here in this list, the list isn't quite accurate. I don't know why they wrote it like this. So the first four uh, rules are no sex, no stealing anything of a value of more than five coins, no killing human beings, and no lying about the personal attainment. So again, these are the four uh, Parajika rules, the first four of the Parajika rules. Um, and then the other two are with a lustful mind, no uh, physical contact with a lustful man, and not to do the eight kinds of misconduct with a man. So uh, again, for people who know about Bikuni Vinya a little bit, you recognize that these are again, two more of the Parajika rules. So Bikunis have eight Parajikas, and six of them are found here in this list for Sikamanas. And now, of course, it starts to make sense um, why these rules should be kept unbroken, because obviously as a bhikkhuni, if you break a parajika, you have to disrobe and you cannot ordain again in this very life. So it makes sense that you have a training period where you try out whether or not you can keep those rules. And if you break one, then you don't have to immediately disrobe, so your chance isn't completely lost, but you can just start over your training and try again. 
so if you have actual paradigmal rules, which are actual rules that everybody, like all Bikunis, have to be have to keep unbroken. If you have those kind of rules as the six rules, then it does make sense why um, they need to be kept unbroken and why a Sikamana should have a higher status than a Samaneri. And it's also kind of likely that in the early period of time, or it's possible that uh, Sikamanas might have also kept the Samaneri rules on top of this. So it's possible that they did keep uh, Samaneri rules as well. So um, now um, we've had uh, an overview of uh, the Sikamana precepts. I hope you have seen um, that the situation is complex. It's not very easy to um, know what the early situation was. Uh, in my personal opinion, it is quite possible that there were no additional rules for Sikamanas in the early period of time. So the idea of six rules uh, might have come up later, which is why there is almost no correspondence between schools. Um, and it's quite possible that Sikamanas would have just been an upgrade from Samaneri, so that they would have kept Samaneri rules, but they would have already, through their ordination, have gotten that connection to the wider Sangha, because as I mentioned, their ordination was done by a full Sangha of Bikunis. So it might just have been an encouragement for them that the full Sangha accepts them and is committed to giving them full ordination in due time and just to, um, yeah, to encourage them and to show them that the Sangha cares about them. Um, so this, I think this is one possible ordination for why the situation is uh, as complex as it is. And uh, on that note, I am going to finish uh, the presentation today. I see I've already gone a little bit over time, uh, but I hope that's okay. And now if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, yes, Vanessa, I see you raised your hand. Yes, hi, thank you. Hi, hi. Sorry, I had to keep turning off my video. People keep knocking on my door. Um, I have a question. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of thoughts about what you're saying. I think you're making my cats. <laughs> Sorry about my cat. Um, you're making a really extensive argument that, again, I want to say I think you should write about questioning how strongly we uphold the Bikuni Vinaya. So I think that's like, a, you're, you're just kind of you're laying it out over and over again. So I think this is really interesting what you're doing. Um, I have a, a technical question. I'm not, I'm not good at Vinaya, but my understanding is that there's a strong argument in scholarship that the Pali Vinaya may have been produced in Sri Lanka. And that when you study the Pali Vinaya in its context and compare it to something like the Mahasangika, it may be that it's locally produced, which is why it might be so different. So I don't know what the histories of the Mahasangika, but a lot of those, I've never looked at this the way you just showed, but a lot of those rules seem to me to be very Brahmanical, um, very caste aware, hierarchically aware. And so I'm wondering if there's a kind of if part of the difference between these traditions is where they're produced and what they're responding to, which may also help your argument. If we can identify the Mahasangika as a North Indian and sustain the argument that Pali is a Sri Lankan production, then that also can help your case, I think. Mm -hmm. So you, were, you think that the Pali version has Brahminical influence or that the Mahasangha? No, I think the Pali version is not Brahminical. I think oh. that one is, and so the argument of people who work on Vinaya in scholarship have repeatedly made the case that the Pali Vinaya is probably got origins of it, obviously North Indian, but that it was mostly produced in Sri Lanka because it doesn't seem to re resonate with a North Indian worldview. But the Mahasangika, the, the six rules that you showed there, set, seem to me just from like looking quickly to like be very cast aware, very aware of certain rituals and trying to separate things out and separate communities in hierarchical ways that I don't see as strongly in the Sri Lankan material. So I'm just wondering, like as part of your research, it may be a question to look at. I don't know what the answer is because I'm not a Vinaya specialist, but whether the, the reason there's such a difference is because they're produced in different parts of South Asia responding to their local communities, right? Which again then raises the question of how seriously can we take 
all of these rules if they're so different and they haven't been properly preserved and unified, mm. right? So this just gives you one more way of kind of targeting your questions is, is the Mahasangika North Indian as opposed to the Pali. Mm. So the, the scholar that's been so strong on arguing the Pali materials being Sri Lankan um, is uh, Gregory Chopin. I don't know if you've read him or know him. I know him. I haven't read too much. Yeah, but, but I know him. Yes. I would definitely recommend. He mm -hmm. makes this case over and over and over again. Um, and he's, he's kind of taken as the classical material at this point in scholarship. Mm -hmm. So it's worth looking at why he thinks that um, and how he makes his case versus what might be the situation in Mahasangika. Mm. Yeah, I mean, definitely, like, as I mentioned, I mean, the Mahasangika has one sub-school that is the Lokuta Ravada, which is the Sanskrit version that we have. Right. And definitely, when we compare the Sanskrit with the Pali, uh, we can see that they have developed in very different um, directions, especially in the rule explanation. And yeah, it, it's very, like, yeah, I also noticed that, that um, they seem to have some, some influences from Brahminical traditions or from, from societies that were just very different. So, well, they're just so, they're interested in different things, mm -hmm. right? Like that's what's so interesting. The Mahasangika is so different. It's, they're not interested in the same stuff. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, why are they interested in these things? Why is this what's bothering them? This is what makes a Shramanari or a Sikamana. Why does that bother them? Yeah. That they have to separate them out and that they're not interested in the precepts as much, right? Mm -hmm. So there's something they're trying to accomplish, yeah. which means that they're responding to something in their context that the others weren't, Yeah. right? So if we get away from, this is all Buddha Vachana, and we go to how are these rules produced? Those are the kinds of questions that I would ask about that group. And that gives you your argument a bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, if, ah, okay, Gillian? Um, I, I know very little about the um, Biku at Amoka, but how different are the rules between the equivalent schools for the men? So we, ah, did you come in a little bit late? Maybe you missed the slide, I think. I did, yes, yes. I apologize. Yes, no um, problem. Um, I would just uh, show you the slide you again. I, I'll, go, I'll go and look at the beginning of the recording. It's okay. No, no, it's okay. No problem. Thank, um, you. Thank you. So did you see this slide, Gillian? Yes. Were, were you, but were you I didn't at this hear, slide? Yeah. Yes, but I didn't hear your introduction to it. So maybe I... Yeah, so we have another ah, slide. Right. This is the biggest slide. Ah, the no, I didn't see slide. the biggest slide at all. So, so you see no. the biggest slide is right. really, there's a really amazing correspondence in all the schools. Uh, the only, yes. the only um, class that seems to be much later is the Sekias. Right. Uh, so yeah, for the Bikus, the situation is very, very different from the Bikunis, which makes the Bikuni situation right. so disappointing because obviously the tradition was able, like would have been able, to uh, preserve mm. things properly, mm. uh, but they just weren't that much interested They've in the stuff. Mm. Yeah. Right, I'm with you, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Abhamita? I would just thank you for putting all this together and presenting it in such a nice way. It, it's really great to, to see that uh, put together uh, like this. It was, actually, it was actually really difficult to make this because I thought like, uh, I just put a few basic things together and make a few slides and then I will add like all the, the juicy points later and then I made a few slides and then I, I, I thought okay I'll just check how long it would take to present this much and then it took two hours and um, so I had to leave out really a lot of stuff so it was really difficult to decide what to include and what to leave out and then, yeah so basically we could have an entire course on Bikuni Vinaya I think and still not run out of stuff to talk about um, yeah Okay, if there are no further questions, I think we can finish for today.
And next time we will continue as usual with our foremost theories. And I think next time will be Patachara. So hopefully that should be interesting. And for today, we will, uh, we will end with uh, three sadhus as usual. And feel free to join me if you want to. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. See you all next week. <laughs>